Well, it's time now to meet my guest on Classic FM this week, the very talented Brian May. Now, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting and talking to the Queen guitarist ahead of the release of his new photographic autobiography called Queen in 3D. It's really amazing and a beautifully produced book. It uses something called stereoscopy to show photos of the band as we've never seen them before. Well, no, I hadn't heard of stereoscopy before either, but it is very clever, albeit a little hard to describe. Well, I think I'll leave it to Brian to elaborate on that and to tell you about his love of classical music. But we began by discussing how this new book came about. It was almost an accident, really. Um, I didn't set out to, to document as we went along. I just happened to always have a 3D camera because I loved it. You know, I'm still fascinated by 3D photography and I have been for, you know, well, most of my life since I was about 12, I suppose, ever since I opened a, a Weetabix packet and found a stereo card in there <laughs> and figured out how it was done. I just loved it. You know, it's, it's in-depth and a flat picture is nice. I like normal photography, mm. but a picture in-depth in 3D is so evocative, so incredibly vivid. And you, you get a viewer with the book, so you can see these things um, like you're looking through a window and you were actually there at the scene. And, yeah, I always loved it. I always carried the cameras, different kinds of cameras. I collected the, the stereo cameras apart from anything else. I just yes, love them I as see. things. Yes. And there was no plan to it. It was like, oh, let's take some pictures, let's do this. And sometimes we would arrive at a venue and I would give my stereo camera to one of the local photographers and say, snap away and see what you get. And I used to have to say, don't turn it on its side because you can't do that with stereo. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you have to view it on your yes. side. And occasionally they would get some great shots of us on stage. And this is Freddie's stuff, of course, you know, and it's great to see Freddie alive and well and vibrant and you know everything there from the muscles the sweat it's so it's so different in 3d you really feel like you it is extraordinary contact. i mean you're you're right aren't you it's something very evocative about it is it because mm. of the depth that you get yeah well it's the way we it, we see the world anyway you know those yes, of us that's true you yes. know unless we're unlucky enough to you know have impaired vision in some way you know we have these two eyes for a very good reason we've evolved that way and if you if you cover one eye and and keep your head still, you quickly realise how much you're missing. The amount of information you get from that stereoscopic experience is is vastly more than you would get otherwise. So why would you make pictures in in a flat form when you can make pictures which reproduce how we see the world? So to me, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's it's got to be better. <laughs> and you know, there's various mechanisms. Sorry. I was just going to say it, it is very beautiful to look at. And I, I like physical books anyway. I, there's something yeah. about holding a physical book. I, I yes. don't find e-books in any way the same. I'm the same. I love the paper and I love the, the tactile quality of yes. it. And also this is a very Victorian thing. You know, we've seen 3D in the movies now. I mean, mm -hmm. I think James Cameron did a wonderful job of, of bringing respectability to 3D movies because yes. he did yes. it right. But uh, the best 3D is the, the intimate victorian way which is with your viewer you're on your own with your viewer in your sort of virtual reality space now vr is basically stereoscopy it's the same thing except you've got the 360 trick added on so in a sense it's full circle when you're in your vr kit you know and i make one of these as an owl vr kit you're in your own world very much like the victorians were when stereoscopy was first invented they all had their viewers they'd sit in their parlors at night and exchange stereo cards with each other you can see all the stereo views of that <laughs> so to me it's very exciting yes. you know, you, you're so you're so keyed in it's like a time machine almost was it difficult to decide what to put in and what to keep out I, I know it took you about three years to produce the book so it it's did obviously yeah. a labor of love it was definitely yeah and in the beginning I didn't think we'd have enough pictures I thought well this is gonna be a small oh, really? book you know and I'll just write a few words and that would be a nice picture book and then my archivist I'm so proud to say I have an archivist. <laughs> He's like the co-author and looks after all my stuff. He ransacked my house and found literally, well, a number of hundreds of stereo pictures that I'd squirreled away in odd corners. And some of them I'd never looked at because they'd never been properly mounted, including some wonderful ones of Freddie backstage. And it's us fooling around a lot of the time you know it's us on stage which is nice you know yes. all the big glory of the lights and stuff but off stage in cars and planes and trains and boats uh, dressing rooms radio stations 
it's all there and the problem in the end was what to leave out it is very very difficult and i think the outtakes will be on an internet site someplace because there's some great <laughs> stuff which i didn't manage to put in there but there's a whole lot of stuff in there really we were able to be very picky yes and the off-stage stuff, I, I think it works so well because you all look so relaxed. Yeah. And as if you have, and particularly Freddie, actually, as yeah. if you're having a really good time. Yes, yeah, nice. Fun. Yeah, I, th I like it particularly. I think Freddie was actually quite a sort of shy person. Mm. And very often if there was a cameraman around, he would kind of stiffen up to a certain extent and he was doing his face and his, his pose, you know. But he was so used to me having a camera, he was relaxed about... 3D stuff and there's there's a couple of pictures in there where well there's one particular one where he's taking a picture of me at the same time I'm, I'm taking a picture of him and you can see he's just having fun yes and that's a precious thing to see now I never thought that it would become a book it never occurred to me at the time it was just fun at the time it was very instant now Freddie had the, his Polaroid camera which in those days was a was a massive deal I yes, mean, it that has never it's... happened before that you could take a picture and it goes bzzz, and you have your picture there in front of you because up to that time you'd have to send them away and wait for the processing and maybe they got lost in the post That's it was right. a very tortuous process <laughs> suddenly it's instant and that was a huge deal we're all used to it now with the, everyone has a phone camera and of course so instant yes, you see yes. It straight away. so all these stereo pictures were also not instant i had to send them away and sort of bite my fingernails until they came back <laughs> But uh, having got them, they're a precious kind of window to the past. Well, they are wonderful. Well, let's pause there because we're going to play some music now. This is the Adagio from the Queen Symphony by Tolga Kashif. Before we play it, I wondered what your thoughts were on other people taking your music and giving it the classical treatment. Interesting. Well, we know, we got to know Tolga and he's a fantastic guy. And it was obvious from the start that his heart was in the right place mm. and also that he was coming to it from a creative view rather than a sort of commercial view because we've had a lot of people, there have been quite a few classical sort of transcriptions of Queen stuff and generally it's not that successful, you know, you have yes. this strange feeling when sometimes you've got a rhythm section and an orchestra and it sits very uncomfortably. Tolga came to it with the idea of just creating something using these pieces which were all in his mind. He, it, was, it wasn't academic, it was very much instinctive with him and we instantly took to him and I, I loved what he came back with. I think it's really great, you know, he, he made no attempt to be complete, it was just I'm doing something, I'm making something out of what I feel when I listen to your music. So it's great, I love it. Encompassing the songs Who Wants to Live Forever and Save Me. That's the third movement of Tolga Kashif's Queen Symphony, performed by Nicola Loud and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. And I'm playing that because my guest on Classic FM this week is the Queen guitarist Brian May. Now, aside from music, Brian has a PhD in astrophysics, and I asked him what it was that got him interested in astronomy in the first place. Patrick Moore. Oh, was it? Oh, <laughs> it wonderful. was definitely Patrick. Yeah, I used to beg to be allowed what to stay out. What a character. Out. Yeah, it was 10pm, which was after my bedtime. <laughs> the sky at night was on. <laughs> yes. And um, it's funny, you know, this is... We're talking classic music, aren't we, here? You know, the, the, the programme was introduced by a, a piece which Patrick himself chose, called At the Castle Gate, from Pelias and Melisande by oh, Sibelius. Yes. And it's so evocative, it's so stirring. When I, when I heard that, I still, when I hear that music, my whole body gets a chill and I can see the universe. It's oh, just... And I think that was a big part of the success of the program. It wasn't what they chose originally. He, they, I forget what they chose, but he went, no, nonsense, we're not having that. We're having <laughs> Pelias and Maison. So he was absolutely my, my hero and I wanted to do that. I wanted to be out there in the stars with him. And much later in my life, I was incredibly privileged to to meet him kind of socially, not due to astronomy, oddly enough, but due to the fact that we had a mutual friend who was producing radio programs. Mm. And we became great friends. He became like an uncle to me, mm. Patrick. And I was able to kind of um, 
in the end rescue him and stop him going into a home and keep him in his house which is a, a nice thing so we became very close and um it's thanks to him that i returned to the phd and i actually got the doctorate 30 years after i started it i am now dr may was he um, prompting you to go back to it then? Absolutely, oh, yeah. He said, you can go back to it, Brian, yeah, of course you can get your PhD. I went, mean, Patrick, there is no chance, you know, this stuff's gone from my head. He said, no, rubbish, of course you can do it. So I got all my old um, writings out, everything was written out longhand, transcribed them all into digital on my laptop, on tour, so my thesis was all there. And then I, I had incredible good fortune, I've been so lucky in my life, I talked about it in an interview, saying that I would kind of like to um, finish off the PhD. And I got a message from the head of astrophysics at Imperial College where I'd started, Professor Ryan Robinson. And he said, if you're serious about this, I will be your supervisor and you can finish your PhD. Now, how often does that happen to you in life? So I, I threw everything up for a year and went back to Imperial College, sat in a little office and became a student. And student, do you know what? It's hard being a student. I, did, I rediscovered <laughs> it's really, really, really difficult to keep your, your optimism up. And I yes, desperately wanted to give up. Three times I nearly gave up my oh, PhD. And that, actually, that's what PhDs are about, is getting through those things. And, and focusing, yes. That's why when somebody gets their PhD, they want to be called the doctor. Because they, they realise that they've been through a kind of They've war. worked really hard, yes. Yeah, so... Um, was it very difficult? Because presumably in the interim there must have been a lot of new research that ah, had been done. Yeah, it was so hell. you had to keep up with that. I had to it's, rediscover it all, 30 yes. years of research. In a sense I was lucky because my area was zodiacal dust, which is dust in the solar system, yeah. and it had become a little bit of a backwater in astronomical research because everybody got interested in cosmology which is obviously astronomy on a huge scale my stuff was astronomy in the backyard of our little solar system but what happened in the interim what just a couple of years before I came back to it it was discovered that other suns have solar systems and in those solar systems there are dust clouds as well the same as ours so suddenly the zodiacal dust cloud became something interesting again yes how do you study dust clouds will you study our own one so i came back at a great time when suddenly it was interesting to everyone again to study the dust we, and of course these dust particles are the smallest um members of our solar system there's quite a lot of them there's a lot of rocks in our solar system from the big ones like jupiter yes. yeah. saturn or whatever right down to small planets down to comets down to asteroids and then these tiny particles which have come off comets and collisions of, of asteroids so the whole ensemble is there you have the whole of creation there and the dust is a big part of it mm. are you ever tempted to become a, a space tourist I, I know that people are offering these these trips yeah. now, does that appeal to you or, or not really? It does in a sense. I'm getting a bit old for it. I'm not <laughs> sure if I could hack it. I don't really fancy being kind of shot up there and having just a few minutes of weightlessness. I don't think that'd be a lot of fun. If I could sit in the ISS for a couple of weeks, yeah. <laughs> If somebody offered that me that, would be a bit special, yeah, I it? think I would do that. Just watch the world turn. That must be incredible. Oh, I, I don't think you'd ever forget that experience, no, would you? No. I've it's... been, I've been in touch with some of the people who, have, you know, Tim Peake, who was up there. I've, I've met and a couple of the other astronauts. In fact, I've met a lot of people who've been up in the ISS, and it sounds great. Mm. You know, there's, there's a price to pay. You know, it's there's hard sides to that, but I guess it's a bit like going on tour. You don't see your family for a while. No, that's <laughs> certainly true. Yeah. Well, let's pause there again, because we're going to play something from, appropriately enough, The Planets by Gustav mm. Holst. Mm. And this is Saturn. Why does his music appeal to you? Oh, I love Holst's planets. I think he was divinely inspired. <laughs> he's, he's a school teacher. Yes. How yeah. amazing, you know, and suddenly he's, he's written this incredible cosmic music. I've always loved it from when I was a kid. And um, I was only about ten years old, I think, when I wrote a little soliloquy which I read into a microphone with the accompaniment of Saturn. Uh, nobody's ever heard that. <laughs> Maybe they will one day. But it was designed to be um, a, a soundtrack for a planetarium show. That was the idea. Oh, right. So maybe one day I'll do that. But uh, I've always loved it. To me, it's absolutely evocative. And um, as I say, you know, it, it's something completely out of this world. I can't imagine how... I can't imagine how it was imagined, to be honest. You know, it's it's not constructed intellectually. 
mm. as far as I can see. It's one of these things which some, somehow he instinctively plucked out of the air. There's so much unusual stuff in Holst's pieces. You know, there's a lot of dissonance, which wasn't very um, prevalent in the, at, at that time. But it wasn't dissonance for its own sake, as it perhaps became later. Well, this is my theory, anyway. Yes. Everything that's in there seems to kind of jolt you into, into being out there in the cosmos. I can't say enough about it, really. I think it's just the most <laughs> wonderful piece of music. All of it, you know, the whole suite is, is brilliant. It's Interesting that he didn't do Pluto, and of course Pluto is now not regarded as a planet as, anyway, so there's no it's... need to put Pluto in there. And I got a bit upset when somebody did that. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Albert Hall and saw it all, and at the end of it, they played this Pluto piece, which I thought was completely inappropriate. Sorry, guys. But I just thought, <laughs> it doesn't work. Get it out of here. So I don't think anyone's going to do that anymore. No. There's no, no need. But... Well, we're going yeah. to hear it now, but Brian, thank you very much indeed. This has been a real <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Great pleasure for me. Thank That's you. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra with Saturn, the bringer of old age, from the planets by Holst. And that's a favourite of Brian May, who I hope you agree was a charming guest. The Queen in 3D book is out now, so do look out for it.